A deadly house fire in Boise, Idaho, claims the lives of a father and his two young stepchildren. As investigators sift through the ashes for answers, they uncover evidence that the blaze was no accident. In Northern California, a man is reported missing, and all indications suggest a tragic accident is to blame. But a routine investigation soon exposes a web of deception, fraud, and possibly murder. When money is at stake, some predators will stop at nothing to exploit another's trust. But even the most complex schemes can't survive the scrutiny of those determined to find justice for victims who have been fatally betrayed. Nestled in the western foothills of the Rocky Mountains, Ada County, Idaho is home to the state capital of Boise. It is also home to some 400,000 residents who work, live, and play here. This is the fire department. In the pre-dawn hours of February 10, 1992, emergency dispatchers received a 911 call. A man reported that his house, a two-story duplex, was on fire and he believed a family of four who shared the house was still trapped inside. Within minutes, firefighters and emergency units from the surrounding area responded to the call. Fire and smoke consumed the duplex. Firefighters struggled to bring the first floor blaze under control. Rescue workers fought their way through the flames and thick smoke to see if anyone had been trapped inside. In a second floor bedroom, they discovered a man lying motionless on the bed. A young girl was found on the floor a few feet away. As the search continued, firefighters recovered the body of a young boy in a nearby bedroom. All of the victims were rushed outside for treatment. But despite the rescue workers' efforts, all three were pronounced dead at the scene. The man who lived in the separate residence inside the duplex told police that around 4 a.m. he was awakened by his smoke alarm. He tried to wake up the other family, but got no response. He identified the victims as 34-year-old Randy Rowe and his two stepchildren. He didn't know the whereabouts of the children's mother, Robin Rowe, who also lived at the residence. Then, two women arrived at the scene. One identified herself as Robin Rowe. Visibly shaken by the news, emergency workers escorted the young mother away from the house. Her friend, Joan McHugh, told police that Robin had fallen asleep at her house earlier that evening. Robin had awakened her just a short while earlier and wanted to return home. She had a premonition that something bad had happened to her family. All of the victim's bodies were removed from the scene and transported to the medical examiner's office for autopsy.
Now, Fire Marshal Doug McGrew began looking for clues to tell him how and why the fire started. We started looking into the uh, ignition source of the fire by doing, like we do on all fires, we do an exterior walk around of the building, we look and see where the least damage is, we go there, and we start working towards the areas where the most damage occurred. Once we get into that area, then we start digging down through and, and layering through the debris and trying to determine exactly what ignited the fire. Almost immediately, investigators made a strange discovery. The circuit breaker that controlled power to the family smoke alarm was in the off position. But that did little to explain how the fire started. And because the damage was so extensive, finding those answers would take time. Within hours, autopsies were performed on Randy Rowe and the two children. The medical examiner found lethal amounts of soot and carbon monoxide in each of the victim's lungs and mucous membranes. He concluded that all three had died as a result of smoke inhalation caused by the fire. As the search for the fire's cause continued into the morning hours, arson investigators sifting through the ashes made a troubling find. On the carpet and in a charred pile of laundry, they discovered burn patterns suggesting a flammable liquid had been poured over the area. And the spot was just inches away from vents that circulate air throughout the residence. Investigators collected several pieces of the charred remains for further analysis. All indications were pointing to arson. And that suggested that the fire that had claimed the lives of the two young children and their stepfather had been intentionally set. To find out, State Fire Marshal Don Dillard delivered the charred samples collected from the house to the Idaho State Police Crime Lab, located in Pocatello. By comparing a burned sample believed to contain an accelerant to one that was untouched by the fire, he hoped criminologists could find answers. What I've asked our criminologists to do is to compare the two, what we feel the one to be evidence, and then the one we feel probably doesn't have any kind of a, an Excel run on it, and she compares those two, and by doing, doing that, uh, you know, hopefully comes to the conclusion that you know, there either is or isn't an Excel run involved in the case. Forensic examiner Susan Williamson began testing the samples for the presence of an ignitable liquid. First, Williamson inserts a strip of charcoal ribbon in the sealed cans that contain the charred samples. Then, the can is placed in a chamber and heated for several hours. If any flammable substance is present, the heat will turn it into vapor which will then be absorbed by the charcoal strip. Once the evidence has been heated, the charcoal strip is removed from the can. To transform any trapped vapors back into a liquid, solvents are then added to the strip. The resulting liquid is then subjected to sophisticated detection equipment that measures for the presence of known flammable substances. When the process was completed, Williamson analyzed the results. One of the samples contained an ignitable liquid. And in this case, I identified a um, an heavy petroleum distillate. And heavy petroleum distillates um, include things like kerosene, um, number two um, and number one diesel fuel and, and fuel, you know, heating fuel oil and so forth. The analysis had exposed the deadly fire as an act of arson. And more disturbing, it had exposed a triple homicide. 
Forensic examiners had exposed a house fire in Ada County, Idaho, that had claimed three lives as a triple murder. The findings were passed on to homicide investigators. Looking for answers, detectives turned to Robin Rowe, the wife and mother of the three victims. Yeah, I, I... When asked why she wasn't at the residence on the night of the fire, Robin explained she had been staying at her friend's house. Over the past few months, her marriage had been falling apart. Well, that was the strange thing. In fact, Robin believed that her husband, Randy, might have intentionally set the deadly fire. She said that recently, Randy had become increasingly abusive toward her. The smallest things would set him off, and he couldn't seem to control his anger, even in front of the children. Robin claimed that on one occasion, Randy had struck her so hard, she was forced to go to the hospital. Several hours before the fire, Randy had called her at her friend's house and demanded that she come home. When she refused, he threatened that she would never see him or her children again. Though it appeared Randy Rowe had made good on his threats, the story troubled veteran detective Gary Rainey. Any parent is protective over their children, and, and had he been this abusive parent, any reasonable spouse would have wanted to remove the kids from that situation. Her story was that he was only abusive with her and not with the kids. That's not the norm, and, and certainly in law enforcement, we recognize that that abusive personality, that violent personality, the anger control problems, is not gonna just be focused on one particular person, especially with those pre-teen age kids who, who sometimes anger parents pretty easily. With their suspicions raised, police wanted to learn more about the Rose marriage and corroborate Robin's alibi. They began with Joan McHugh, the woman who had been with Robin at the time of the fire. Well, there, there was some abuse problems. Because of Randy's abuse, Robin, she said, had been staying with her. That night, Robin had fallen asleep on her couch around 11 p.m. And then, uh, okay. Joan went to bed a short while later and never heard anything to suggest Robin ever left the apartment. Joan had no doubt that Robin was a victim of domestic violence. And she said that it had been going on for quite a while, but she had never said anything to anyone. And it just seemed to escalate over a period of, I don't know, about four or five weeks. And a few times she came here, 10 or 11 o'clock with the children, because they were escaping from Randy. The information gave Robin Rowe a solid alibi for the time of the three deaths. And the result of the forensic analysis had made it plausible that Randy Rowe had, in fact, killed himself and his two stepchildren in a vengeful act of rage. But that theory would not go unchallenged. I learned uh, that there had been some domestic violence going on. But then, as a couple other people called, and I learned that there wasn't domestic violence going on, according to them. And so I just started not adding up very well. To learn more, police brought in Randy Rowe's sister to answer questions. Um, any signs that, that Robin or the kids were the victims of any kind of violence, any bruises by anybody? She didn't believe that Robin was the victim of domestic violence, as she had portrayed herself to be. I don't feel ever any discussion. Though Randy and Robin had begun to fight more and more, he was not a violent person. The kids were Randy's life. His sister knew that he never would have harmed them. And according to the sister, Robin treated Randy as little more than her kid's babysitter. As a result, Randy talked openly about the possibility of divorce. But he loved the children as if they were his own. And the kids made it clear that they didn't want Randy to go. 
the children had at one time reportedly told Robin that they wanted to stay with Randy and not go with her. And of course they were Robin's natural children and not Randy's. To resolve all of the conflicting information about the couple, investigators decided to take a closer look into Robin Rowe's background. What they found was shocking. According to records, Robin had tragically lost a son nearly 15 years earlier. Her six-year-old boy had died in a suspicious fire at her California home. Arson investigators were never able to determine a cause of the fire. But for Idaho police, the similarities between the tragedies had to be more than coincidental. Robin Rowe was now emerging as the prime suspect in the deaths of her husband and two children. But with an airtight alibi and no obvious motive to explain such an unthinkable crime, police knew that proving it would not be easy. Police in Ada County, Idaho, struggled to find answers in a deadly house fire that had claimed three lives. Robin Rowe, the wife and mother of the victims, had an airtight alibi for the night of the murders. But all of the evidence was pointing to her as the prime suspect. What investigators needed was proof. Looking for potential clues, they began reviewing statements made by Robin's friends and family. They found that one friend had stated that a few days prior to the fire, Robin had mentioned that she had rented a storage unit and had taken some of her belongings there. The timing of the rental was too close to the murders for police to ignore. Detective Gary Rainey followed up on the lead. Soon, he was able to locate the unit that Robin had rented. With a warrant in hand, investigators were dispatched to the storage unit. There, they found boxes of personal papers belonging to Robin. Among the items was an envelope filled with several hundred dollars in cash and bingo receipts from the YWCA where Robin Rowe worked. Police also collected several life insurance policies taken out on Robin Rowe's husband and her two children. Robin was listed as the sole beneficiary on all of the policies. And she stood to gain more than $275,000 from the three deaths. It was powerful circumstantial evidence of murder. One of the most disturbing facts being that she took out the last two policies. She already had multiple policies, but Robin took out the last two policies on the children, January 24th, and the fire was February 10th. Still, it wasn't enough to take Robin Rowe into custody. Never really Police began interviewing Robin's co-workers at the YWCA. The manager was surprised to learn that cash and receipts had been found in the storage facility. Robin had reported that proceeds from the Wise last bingo game had been destroyed in the house fire that killed her family. Though authorities lacked hard physical evidence of murder, they now had proof of embezzlement. The prime suspect in the triple homicide investigation was placed under arrest and charged with grand theft. But police were a long way from proving that Robin Rowe was a cold-blooded killer. Hoping to generate a lead that could destroy her alibi, details of the crime were released through the media. A short while later, police got a tip. A local newspaper delivery man called and told police that he remembered something unusual on the night of the fire. He said that while making deliveries around 4 a.m. that morning, he saw a car driving away from the duplex. 
He wasn't sure of the make of the car, but he described it as a late model four-door with rectangular taillights. Detective Ken Smith asked the delivery man to come down to the station. We had, um, prior to his um, arrival at the sheriff's office, had arranged to have vehicles um, similar to Robin Rowe's vehicle in the back lot, and Robin Rowe's vehicle was in the back lot. Uh, we walked him into the lot and asked him to look for vehicles that, or look and see if there were any vehicles that matched the description of the vehicle that he had seen um, in the subdivision on the morning of the fire. When he observed Robin Rowe's vehicle, he immediately um, pointed to that vehicle and stated that it was uh, the same body style, same color, um, and um, resembled uh, the car that he had seen. You sure? Definitely. The witness had placed a car similar to Robin Rowe's near the crime scene just a short while before fire consumed the duplex. Detectives still had to overcome a major obstacle. Robin's friend, Joan McHugh, had provided her with a solid alibi for the time of the homicides. Though police didn't think Joan was lying, they theorized that Robin had managed to slip out of the apartment undetected. Detective Gary Rainey was determined to find out. I devised a scenario to try to prove or disprove Robin's presence in the apartment, and that was to have Joan confront Robin with the idea that she got up in the middle of the night, 3.30 in the morning, which was the time that we knew about when the fire started, that Joan would tell Robin that she came downstairs to get a drink of water and Robin wasn't there. When contacted, Joan McHugh agreed that the next time Robin called her from prison, she would tell her the false story and record the conversation. Joan was only too happy to cooperate. I'm sure, um, I really shouldn't speak for Detective Ramey, but I'm sure that he believed that somewhere in the phone calls she would absolutely destroy all of her alibis. And I just knew that she was going to explain everything and he was going to feel like a fool because she was innocent. There is no way a mother kills her children. And um, so I agreed to tape the phone calls. On the evening of February 20th, Robin called Joan Hello. from prison. Yeah, it's Robin. There's something that I have to talk to you about. That morning, I came downstairs, and you weren't here, Robin. Where were you? Yeah, I know. I, I went outside. I went it outside. wasn't the answer she expected. Robin repeated her story that at around 3.30 a.m., she was awakened by a strange premonition that something bad had happened to her family. But now, she added that she then contacted a psychiatrist and left the apartment to speak with her for over an hour. On tape, Robin had destroyed her alibi. Joan McHugh was devastated. It, it was terrible. And I didn't know what to do after. It was on a tape recording. And it was like, you know, do I call Gary or do I just take this thing and throw it in the trash and no one will ever know. But I would have known. And um, it probably sounds dramatic, but Randy and the children deserve better than that. So I call Gary. Police finally had enough evidence to charge Robin Rowe with three counts of first degree murder. Based on the evidence, detectives believe that in the early morning hours of February 10th, Robin Rowe slipped out of her friend's house and returned to her own home. She turned off power to the smoke alarm. Then, driven by a twisted desire to cash in on her family's life insurance policies, she placed a pile of laundry near the air vents and set the deadly blaze. After murdering her husband and two children, Robin calmly returned to Joan McHugh's house to establish her alibi. Psychological experts have described to me that it, it's simply a balance in her mind of what she personally is better off with, a husband and two children 
or the proceeds of life insurance policies and the opportunity to move to a new state. And that she simply weighed those two things and decided that the money and the new life was what she wanted today. Robin Rowe was convicted of arson and three counts of first degree murder in the deaths of her husband, Randy, and her two children. She was sentenced to death. Idaho police had to reconcile conflicting information to find the truth. In California, detectives must follow a complex maze in order to expose a murder. Known for its temperate climate and lush farmland, Yolo County, California offers a quiet rural lifestyle, miles outside the state capital of Sacramento. But residents there are no strangers to tragedy. On the morning of February 5th, 1997, 911 dispatchers at the Yolo County Sheriff's Department received a call from a concerned mother. She feared that her son was missing. Deputies responded to the home. Patty Howard told the officer that she hadn't seen or heard from her 18-year-old son, Nick, since the previous evening. Patty said that the night before, Nick had helped her close up the auto body shop that the Howard family owned. As they were leaving, Nick said he had to retrieve a wallet he had left behind at a nearby restaurant. He told his mother he would be home in a couple of hours and said goodbye. But around midnight, Nick called and left a message on the answering machine. He said he was having car problems and was running late. But he never made it home that night. The family was very close, and it was completely out of character for Nick not to call and check in. Missing teenagers often turn up within a few days. But for Yolo County Detective Larry Cecchettini, Nick Howard didn't seem to fit the profile of a typical runaway. This is probably one of the closest knit families um, that I've ever seen. They just, from all indications, they were a very close, very loving family. Uh, for Nick to call and not come home uh, was just something that had never happened before. Investigators feared the teenager's car troubles had led to an accident. Police, friends, and family retraced his usual route. But after two days, the search had turned up nothing. Then, two men out on the search flagged down a patrol car near the banks of the Sacramento River. They had discovered tire tracks that led from the shoulder of the road down toward the riverbank. Right down up here? Right, right over here. Why do you think these are next? I uh, figured nobody else would be laying those tracks down there. I don't know. Right, uh, One of the men, 42-year-old Ralph Marcus, said he was a close friend of the Howard family. Charles 22, I think we have a 972 that went over the cliff. You could start dark. 10 -4. Ralph said that he and his associate, Jake Stanton, were out looking for Nick when they came upon the tracks. Unsure if the discovery was related to Nick's disappearance, Detective Cecchettini was contacted. He knew that stretch of highway well, and the news was not encouraging. That's what I was thinking. This strip of roadway is a winding strip of river road. There are no guardrails on our county side. Uh, quite frequently, uh, inattentive or sleepy drivers do go into the river. Search and rescue units from the Yolo County Sheriff's Department and officers from the California Highway Patrol responded to the scene. The team followed the tracks down an embankment. They led to the water's edge 
and then disappeared into the river. Members of the Yolo County Boat Patrol and rescue divers began scouring the river. After several hours of searching, divers signaled they had found something. 16 feet below the surface, they had discovered a vehicle resting on the riverbed. A tow truck pulled the car from the muddy river. The vehicle matched the description of the one driven by Nick Howard. A wallet recovered from the passenger seat contained the driver's license of the missing teenager. Examiners began searching the vehicle for clues. On the floorboard, they found Nick's prescription eyeglasses. They were bent as if his head had violently impacted the dashboard or the steering wheel. Then, police noticed that a film of oil coated the vehicle's interior. It appeared to have come from an opened container of motor oil located in the back seat. The vehicle was towed to a police impound lot for a more thorough examination. Officers and divers from the boat patrol continued searching the area for any signs of Nick Howard. But there was no trace of the teenager. And if he was unconscious and not wearing his seatbelt when he went into the river, the powerful currents had likely carried his body miles away. With so many unanswered questions, police looked for clues to explain the accident. But aside from the tire tracks at the side of the road, little else was found. Usually if the vehicle went into the water at a high rate of speed, you're going to have a lot of broken rocks, you're going to have debris, uh, possibly some skid marks, um, some significant physical evidence. As the investigation continued, detectives received some unexpected information. Nick Howard's family had handed over some papers they found while going through his room. One was a life insurance policy in the teenager's name that was worth $850,000. There was also an uncompleted change of beneficiary form that listed Ralph Marcus, the man who had discovered the tire tracks at the river, as the new beneficiary. Police were surprised that someone as young as Nick Howard would have such a large insurance policy. Essentially, he was spending a quarter of his monthly income on a life insurance policy, which struck us as odd. It's not something that, uh, life insurance just isn't something that an 18-year-old thinks about, especially when it costs that amount of money. Why don't you have a seat right there? And that wasn't the only troubling news. An acquaintance of Nick Howard's came forward with information. Tell me about this life insurance. He believed that Nick was alive and well. Recently, he said, the teenager had boasted that his life insurance policy would make him a millionaire. He had this big policy. All he had to do was fake his own death, disappear, and then have Ralph Marcus collect on the policy. A polygraph test later confirmed he was telling the truth. The frantic search for a missing teenager had taken an unexpected turn. Now, investigators had to consider that Nick Howard had staged the auto accident and his own disappearance. To find out, police enlisted the aid of the California Highway Patrol's Accident Reconstruction Unit. Using the tire tracks found by the side of the road as his guide, investigator Steve Walker surveyed the scene. Detailed measurements indicated that the car had left the road at a 45-degree angle. 
and there was no evidence of vaulting or bouncing onto the shoulder. That suggested the car was traveling no faster than 14 miles per hour when it left the road. It was unlikely that a sleeping or inattentive driver had caused the vehicle to end up in the river. And there was no evidence suggesting that a collision had taken place. There was no debris, there were no um, uh, fluids, on, stains on the roadway. There was nothing that, would, that you typically see in a traffic collision. It was very, very anomalous. And uh, it likewise fit the uh, idea that the car had uh, um, not departed from the roadway in a violent manner, that it was uh, set up to leave the roadway in a more controlled manner. Police next examined the engine of Nick Howard's car, looking for any mechanical problems that could explain the accident. Almost immediately, they found a clue. A plastic bottle cap had been intentionally wedged into the engine's throttle, holding it open and the cap had originated from the opened container of motor oil recovered from the vehicle's interior. With their suspicions raised, police turned to auto expert Charles Radford of the California Highway Patrol. To determine the significance of the findings, he conducted an experiment. He wedged the cap into the throttle of a car with a similar manual transmission engine. He put the car in gear and then turned on the ignition. The engine revved up to 6,000 RPMs and then lurched forward. And we could get speeds in second of as high as 20 miles an hour. And in fourth gear, it was approximately 15 miles an hour within a 100 to 150 foot range. Um, what this shows is that it, was, it would be very easy for someone to be able to take a car and put it in the river by use of an oil bottle cap. All of the evidence police had gathered now led them to believe that 18-year-old Nick Howard had in fact staged his own disappearance. And now he was wanted for questioning in the elaborate insurance fraud scheme. But so far, all efforts to locate the teenager had turned up nothing. Police in Yolo County, California, continued their search for 18-year-old Nick Howard. While looking for answers, they uncovered evidence suggesting the teenager and his friend, Ralph Marcus, had staged the disappearance. It appeared to be an elaborate scam to collect on a life insurance policy worth $850,000. But with Nick Howard's whereabouts uncertain, police turned their focus to Ralph Marcus, the beneficiary of the insurance policy. A background check on the 42-year-old heightened Detective Larry Cecchettini's suspicions that the disappearance was in fact a hoax and that Ralph Marcus was somehow involved. Ralph Marcus had done thefts, identity scams, insurance fraud, bankruptcy fraud. He was a drug runner. Under questioning, Ralph Marcus denied any involvement in Nick's disappearance. And he knew nothing about any insurance scams. Tell me about your relationship with him. Ralph said he had been a friend of the Howard family for years. Nick was like a godson to him. He was shocked to learn that he was the beneficiary of Nick's life insurance policy. Ralph said he wasn't interested in the money. Police sensed he was lying. But with no hard evidence, they had no choice but to release him. The investigation was going nowhere. Then, on February 25th, 1997, Three weeks after Nick Howard disappeared, Yolo County Police got a break. But it wasn't one they had expected. A man fishing on the Sacramento River had called police after discovering human remains. 
Less than a mile from where Nick Howard's car was found, police recovered the partially decomposed remains of a young man. The victim, found with a single glove on his right hand, matched the description of the missing teenager. And dental records later confirmed that Nick Howard had finally been found. With no obvious cause of death, the body was transported to the Yolo County Coroner's Office. There, forensic pathologist Dr. Brian Peterson began looking for answers. Here's some pictures of the body, how we found them on scene. Mm -hmm. A close examination of the glove and the clothing indicated that no traces of motor oil were present. And that suggested the victim was not in his car when it went into the water. For Detective Cecchettini, the findings didn't make sense. A couple of things just didn't add up. For one, um, the body had, was wearing one glove, which we thought was somewhat unusual. Uh, I remembered that the car was coated with motor oil uh, when we initially located it, but the, yet there were no traces of motor oil on the clothing. Granted, he'd been in the water for some time, but the traces of motor oil are not going to be entirely washed from the body. Dr. Peterson next looked to establish a cause of death. Fluid found in the victim's lung suggested Nick Howard had drowned. But there was also something else. Additionally, there were changes consistent with manual strangulation bleeding inside the muscles of the neck. Nick Howard had been murdered. For the Howard family and for investigators, the discovery was devastating. In addition to the tragic loss, it was now clear that Nick Howard had not staged his own disappearance. And Ralph Marcus was now the prime suspect in his death. Now we have a body. Um, we've pretty much determined that the body was not in the car when it went in. We have an $850,000 potential life insurance payout, and we have the beneficiary, and we're doing everything that we can to make sure that we get to the bottom line on this and get to the truth of what happened. Police contacted the insurance agent in nearby Sacramento who handled Nick's policy. According to records, Nick came in a few weeks before he disappeared, requesting that Ralph Marcus be named the new beneficiary. But he didn't have all of the correct paperwork, and the change was not completed. But Nick didn't seem to understand, and the agent believed that he left that day, convinced that his policy had in fact been updated. In the insurance agent's opinion, when Nick left, he was under the impression that the change was completed and that Ralph Marcus was the beneficiary. Though incriminating, the information fell short of the smoking gun investigators would need to prove murder. Then they got a break. A witness asked Detective Cecchettini to meet him at a pier on the Sacramento River. Jake Stanton, the man who was with Ralph Marcus when the tire tracks were discovered at the river, believed he had important information about the case. Jake said that shortly after Nick went missing, Ralph had asked for his help in searching for the teenager. While driving along the Sacramento River, Ralph pulled up to the pier. He said it was one of Nick's favorite spots. As they searched the area, Jake saw Ralph Marcus walk to the end of the pier toward a black glove. As Jake turns around, he sees Ralph ditch the glove off the top of the pier. Before Jake even says anything, Ralph mentions to him, I was trying to get the glove. Detectives showed Jake the black glove recovered from Nick Howard's body. You ever see anything that looks like this? He was certain it was identical to the one Marcus had kicked off the pier. Jake was adamant about the fact that Ralph was trying to kick the glove off so that it could not be recovered. 
the significance of this is that we had never told anybody that when Nick was found, he was wearing one glove. The information brought police one step closer to proving that Ralph Marcus had murdered 18-year-old Nick Howard. But so far, all of the evidence was circumstantial. Police in Yolo County, California, were now certain that 18-year-old Nick Howard had been murdered for his life insurance policy, worth $850,000. All of the evidence suggested that Ralph Marcus, the beneficiary of the policy, was responsible. The suspect was brought in for another interview. Police showed him the black glove that had been recovered from the victim. Though witnesses saw Marcus kick an identical glove into the Sacramento River, he claimed he hadn't seen one like it before. Marcus continued to insist that he had no knowledge of Nick's life insurance policy and was in no way involved in his death. He pointed to the fact that he had gone to great lengths to help find Nick after he disappeared. But detectives believe that Ralph Marcus had only done that in order to divert attention from himself. Thank you very much. Thank Authorities you. obtained a warrant to search the home Ralph Marcus shared with his mother. There, they found several documents relating to Nicholas Howard's insurance policy. And Marcus was in the process of filing a claim for the $850,000. The suspect was well aware of Nick's life insurance policy, something he had repeatedly denied. He was placed under arrest and charged with first degree murder. Police believe that Ralph Marcus was able to get 18-year-old Nick Howard to agree to stage his own death after making him the beneficiary of his life insurance policy. But Marcus never intended to split up the money. Once the plan was in place, he beat and strangled the teenager, then tossed him into the river to die. After placing the teenager's wallet and glasses inside the vehicle, Marcus rigged the engine of Nick's car with an oil cap and sent the vehicle into the water, hoping his death would appear as an accident. Ralph Marcus was convicted of the first degree murder of Nicholas Howard and sentenced to life in prison. Greed and self-interest can be strong motivations for murder. And when the killer is cunning, the truth can be elusive. But detectives and forensic scientists are dedicated to finding justice for unsuspecting victims who have found themselves betrayed. In the pre-dawn hours, a house catches fire in Wisconsin. Investigators determine that the blaze is a smokescreen designed to hide a more horrific act of violence. But the heat of the flames leaves the crime trail cold. In southern Florida, a series of fires becomes more than a coincidence. People are dying, and a community is frightened. Detectives must work quickly to calm fears and catch the killer before he strikes again. At a crime scene, everything is considered a potential clue. But a fire can destroy everything in its path, challenging forensic investigators at every turn and making each arson a trial by fire.
In this episode, some of the names have been changed. Two thirty in the morning, November twenty fifth, nineteen ninety six. Most of La Crosse, Wisconsin, slept. But one of its residents woke up to an alarming sight. The neighbor's house is on fire. What's the address, sir, please? He noticed smoke pouring from his neighbor's house. Fire trucks raced to the scene. Arriving moments later to find it consumed by flames. If anyone was home, firefighters feared they were trapped inside. The cross firefighter Dan Skiles knew he and his men had to get in quickly if they hoped to get anyone out alive. But there appeared to be no way in. So instead of my normal routine of putting my shoulder into that door and pushing it open. I decided to sit down and use my legs to kick the door open. Firefighter Skiles kicked open the door and discovered the floor of the kitchen completely destroyed by the fire. With no path to guide them, they relied on each other, making their way through the flames and looking for anyone who was trapped inside. The person on the nozzle yelled out that he had a victim. We picked him up. I dragged him as far as I could before I ran out of air. Despite their best efforts, firefighters pulled a man's lifeless body out of the burning rubble. It was the homeowner, 64-year-old Donald Harmasek, and firefighter Dan Skyle suspected something else was wrong. There was blood on his head. And I thought that that was unusual for a victim in a house fire to have any type of blood on him. It was at that moment firefighters suspected they were dealing with something more than an accident. The body was transported to the morgue for autopsy. La Crosse, Wisconsin detectives Dave Shotsley and Kerry Jaholski interviewed the neighbor who phoned police. And although he saw the flames, he said he did not see or hear anything out of the ordinary. Once the fire department declared the house safe for entry, fire investigators went to work. Deputy Fire Marshal Gene Brink began the preliminary investigation to determine the fire's point of origin. A fire investigator in determining the cause of the fire starts in the area of least damage the outside of the house or the living room where there was no fire and works back to the area of most damage. The house was cluttered with books and magazines. Detectives opened them and found money hidden inside. But the victim's wallet was found empty on the table. As firefighters packed up, Fire Marshal Brink went down to the basement and inspected the debris, looking for some explanation for the blaze. I want to show you why I think I'm convinced we had a set fire here. In our investigation, we determined that the fire had started in the basement. That's where the greatest burn had occurred. We found one area under the kitchen where the fire had burned on top of a pile of magazines. Where there was no heat producing device in the area. We had a set fire at that one particular place. This was an arson. Lacrosse arson investigators checked the outside perimeter of the house. They needed to find out who started the fire and why. They noticed a broken basement window. Investigators believed whoever started the fire may have entered through that window. In the snow, one of them discovered an undisturbed shoe print leading away from the house. Since it was dark, he covered the print with a metal trash can in order to preserve this possible clue. The autopsy was performed at the Veterans Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. 
the medical examiner found deep circular wounds in the victim's skull. The force of the blows caused severe hemorrhaging and trauma, rendering him unconscious and unable to escape the fire. Now, along with arson, authorities believed they were also investigating a murder. Okay, everybody, we want to get a briefing in and get some job assignments. Early the, the next morning here. at the La Crosse right. Police Department, right. investigators right. compared the information they gathered so far. Detective Joe Dunham was one of the lead investigators on the case. The uh, coroner thought it was a gunshot, but then he determined later it was a blunt instrument to the head that killed Mr. Armachek. Uh, there's a footprint on the east side of the house in the snow. Of the Detectives also officers. needed to follow up on the most promising clue so far, the footprint left in the back of the house. At the crime scene, technicians arrived to make a cast of the frozen shoe print. The snow's hardened crystalline structure captured the most intricate detail, but it had to be handled carefully so as not to destroy the print. Before a cast was attempted, the shoe print was photographed just in case. Hot sulfur, which solidifies on contact with the cold snow, was used as the casting medium. The sulfur hardens almost instantly, ensuring the snow does not melt before the cast is created. It recorded every groove and pattern of the shoe print. The newly formed cast was sent to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab. Inside the house, blood spatter stained the furniture and the surrounding floor. Forensic scientist Nick Stalke reconstructed the fatal scenario. The stains that were on the front of this chest of drawers were two to six millimeters in size. Those are indicative of a uh, stains that you would see at a, a beating or, or a stabbing. He stretched pieces of string back from the blood spatter to determine the position of the victim at the moment of the attack. By the point of convergence of the blood stains, I was able to determine that Mr. Harmasek was beaten just in front of this chest of drawers. We did find a hammer that was in the area of these blood stains. The chest of drawers and the hammer were sent to the crime lab for analysis. A La Crosse police officer spoke with Shirley Otto the victim's longtime companion. So right now you can't think of anybody that would want to do any harm to him? She and Donald Harmasek had been together for over 20 years. She told the officer they had a good relationship, that Donald was well-liked, and everyone called him by his nickname, Pops. Shirley also told the officer that Donald had been upset recently because his house had been repeatedly burglarized. La Crosse police detectives Joe Dunham and Brad Berkey looked into police reports and arrest records involving burglaries of the Harmasic residence. They found no shortage of names. It appeared perpetrators considered Donald Harmasic an easy mark. He was someone that we knew kept money in his residence, and he had been targeted in the past by various burglars. Police went to question a known local petty thief named Adam Tallbridge. But when he heard the police, he ran. Tallbridge looked like a promising suspect. Back at the station, he denied any involvement with the Harmasic homicide. Tallbridge claimed he panicked when he heard the police. That is why he ran. He agreed to cooperate and allowed his tennis shoes to be tested. They were sent out for analysis to the state crime lab. 
where forensic scientist Jerry Cota Jarvie was analyzing the footprint casts from the crime scene. There are a lot of shoes that have the same size and tread design, but it's the unique characteristics that identifies that shoe to that impression. They're like cuts and um, uh, missing pieces and wear and so on. He determined that the footwear worn at the scene was an airwalk tennis shoe, the same type worn by Tallbridge. But when he compared the casts to the sneakers, he found the shoes were the wrong size. Adam Tallbridge was not their man. Then, Cota Jarvie discovered something unusual. There were actually two separate and distinct shoe prints, one on top of the other. He concluded they were now looking for two suspects, not one. Detective Berkey realized they had to rethink their investigation. Detective and Donald and I both believed that there might be more to this. I mean, that information I mean, pointed us in the right direction. Investigators still had no idea who killed Donald Harmasek, and they faced an even greater challenge. They were now looking for two suspects and their hope was that the newly discovered shoe prints would lead them straight to the killers. 64-year-old Donald Harmasek was murdered and his house set on fire to cover up the crime. Investigators discovered they were now searching for two suspects, but so far the crime scene yielded a limited number of clues and detectives Brad Berkey and Joe Dunham were frustrated. When you burn a body, you take a lot of evidence with it. And also, when you burn the home, there you take a lot of evidence there. It was a challenge. We had a big challenge ahead of us because we had no suspects in this brutal murder. At the crime lab, forensic scientists continued their investigation. Nick Stalky studied the victim's blood-spattered cabinet. Soot marks and spatter indicated that one of the drawers was partially open at the time of the murder. The chest of drawers provided Nick Stalky with important information. The individual was beaten in, just in front of this chest of drawers, and then the drawers were repositioned, and then the fire started. It told us then that not only did the individuals beat the victim, but they also then ransacked that house after he was down and bleeding, and then started the fire and left. Investigators now believe the perpetrator set the fire with the intent to cover up an even greater crime. At the Wisconsin State Crime Lab, forensic scientist Ken Olson tested debris from the burned house. He believed a flammable liquid was used to start the blaze. It's very difficult to just take uh, materials that are present uh, to start a fire, but with an ignitable liquid, you can accelerate that fire and get it going faster. Liquid accelerants leave traces behind that slowly evaporate. The debris collected was placed inside a can along with a carbon strip. Carbon absorbs any traces of the accelerant left behind. The can is sealed and then heated to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I then take that paint can with the charcoal strip inside, place it into the oven. After heating for 16 hours, the carbon strip is then put into a gas chromatograph that analyzes the chemical components of the accelerant. I take that vial and put it on the instrument, and uh, it's uh, automated, uh, injects the solvent into the instrument, and I'm looking for any known accelerants that are there. Every chemical has a unique molecular fingerprint. The chromatograph reveals that molecular structure. 
I examined uh, the residues that I recovered and found uh, the residues of gasoline in uh, three of the samples that were collected from the scene. Investigators turned to the community and they set up a crime solver's tip line. The leads began to pour in. One of the callers claimed a man named Todd Carpenter knew something about the murder. Detectives brought Carpenter in for questioning. He began to spell out his involvement, telling investigators he was contacted by two men. He was approached by Nathan Lindell and Josh Lindell, and that he was a driver, and they were just going there for a burglary. According to Carpenter, the Lindell brothers heard a rumor that Donald Harmasek kept lots of cash in his house, and they wanted it. The brothers offered Carpenter money to drive the getaway car. Carpenter told the detectives he stayed with the car while Nathaniel and Josh Lindell committed the burglary. He waited outside while Josh and Nathan Lindell went inside the residence looking for money and rummaged around the basement and went upstairs looking for money. And at that time, they, were, they, they stumbled across Donald Harmacek. Afterwards, the brothers instructed him to drive to the top of Granddad Bluff, a secluded spot overlooking the city of La Crosse. There, they built a fire and burned the clothes they had been wearing including their shoes. Carpenter was surprised when Nathaniel told him the man inside the house was, quote, toast by now. The brothers paid Carpenter his money. In total, they had stolen $300 from Harmasek. Carpenter said he got nervous when he heard about the murder on the news the next day. Detectives ran the Lindell brothers' names through the computer. Josh Lindell's record was clean, but Nathaniel had a rap sheet riddled with prior arrests, including burglary. Okay, Marcus. Investigators began to believe Carpenter, but they had no concrete evidence to back up his story. In the hopes of getting some, detectives convinced him to wear a wire. Maybe they could catch Nathaniel incriminating himself. Carpenter went to see Nathaniel. He told him the police were asking a lot of questions. He said he was scared. He didn't know what to do or say. It's just been coming by my work, asking me all kinds of questions, you know, about who I was with and who I hate. Nathaniel with. played it cool. He indicated knowledge of the crime, but said nothing that could actually incriminate himself. He was telling him to stay cool and just, you know, don't tell him anything, and and that uh, those SOBs, you know, they, they ain't going to get nothing out of me. They were convinced Nathaniel Lindell was the mastermind but the wired conversation was no proof. Since Carpenter couldn't help them anymore, detectives hoped Josh Lindell could. He did agree to speak with us, and that surprised me. His initial statement to us, he took the blame. Detectives finally got the break they needed, but the extreme violence of the crime and their strongest piece of evidence, the shoe prints, pointed to two killers. Detectives knew they needed more if they were to catch them both. La Crosse, Wisconsin detectives were deep in the middle of the arson murder investigation of 64-year-old Donald Harmasek. The footprints found in the snow led investigators to two suspects, the Lindell brothers. Detectives Joe Dunham and Brad Berkey had placed Josh Lindell in custody. Although he claimed he acted alone, the detectives knew differently. Detective Brad Berkey hoped Josh would give up his brother. I believed that he was involved, 
but I never expected him in the interview to tell us that he was the one that did this. I fully expected him to tell us that his brother was more involved than he was, and that surprised me. He was remorseful that he did this, felt bad about it, and he was trying to make some amends by telling us uh, what he did. Although Josh was taking the blame, in order to prove their case, detectives needed him to reveal his brother's involvement. Josh appeared nervous. He said he had never been in trouble with the law. And after hours of questioning, Josh Lindell finally admitted the whole story. He said he and Nathaniel broke in through the basement window, stepping on each other's footprints to obscure their tracks and to throw off police. So we're gonna look for those. They found Donald Harmasek asleep on the couch and panicked. and I hit him over the head. Now you want to speak with us in regard to this? He said his brother Nathan also repeatedly struck the victim in the head with a hammer and left him for dead. Then they set the house on fire to cover up their crime. Josh's story matched Todd Carpenter's. He said they drove up to the bluff so he and his brother could burn their clothes and destroy evidence. Murder was never part of the plan. Although by the time they left, the plan had fallen apart. After Josh's confession, investigators had what they needed to bring in Nathaniel for breaking and entering, arson, and the murder of Donald Harmasa. They arrested him at the apartment he shared with his roommate. And place you in the squad car after he searches you. When we get down to the police station, then we'll he was handcuffed and taken to the okay. police station, where he was booked. Detectives also came armed with a search warrant. They questioned Nathaniel's roommate and searched for evidence. Even though Josh said they burned the shoes they wore, investigators collected another pair at his apartment. At the state crime lab, the shoes confiscated from Nathaniel were determined to be airwalks, the same style and tread design of the shoe print cast. Although not an exact match, the wear pattern was uniquely similar to those worn at the crime scene. Despite the evidence against him and the fact that both Todd Carpenter and his own brother Josh incriminated him, Nathaniel Lindell refused to talk. He would not speak to us, that's his right, of course. But uh, Nathan is uh, cold-hearted, uh, would, would uh, do anything. Based on the evidence, police determined that Nathaniel and Josh Lindell broke into Donald Harmasek's home, intending to burglarize it. Josh was surprised to find the homeowner asleep on the sofa. Armasek began to stir. Josh panicked. Nathaniel then struck him with the hammer he'd used to break the basement window, beating him unconscious. On their way out, the brothers took the money from the victim's wallet. They set the house on fire to cover up the murder. They then carefully stepped in each other's footprints, hoping to fool the authorities. It didn't turn out that way. I believe Josh was uh, definitely part of the crime, but he was not the leader of the group. It was Nathan Lindell, his older brother, that was the leader. On February 3rd, 1998, Nathaniel Lindell was convicted of first-degree murder, burglary, and arson. He was sentenced to life in prison. He will be eligible for parole in 50 years. His brother, Josh Lindell, was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life. He will be eligible for parole in 25 years. In exchange for his testimony, Todd Carpenter was not charged. 
Lacrosse homicide detectives narrowed in on one piece of forensic evidence, yielding two suspects who used arson to hide their crime. In Florida, authorities faced an ever-widening challenge as a string of similar fires became more than a coincidence. In the early morning of August 7, 1993, in Spring Hill, Florida, the Hernando County Fire Department responded to a burning residence. Firefighters raced to the home of 80-year-old Becky Saunders. When they arrived, the flames had already ravaged a large portion of the house. The extreme heat was overwhelming, and the entrances were blocked. But the firefighters did all they could to rescue the elderly resident and salvage her home. It took hours, but the firefighters finally got the fire under control. Forensic specialist Gary Kimball investigated. Due to the extensive nature of the fire, we ran into some problems. We were unable to examine a lot of the things that we would like to have examined because they just weren't there anymore. The heat was so intense, any potential evidence was destroyed. Investigators were unable to identify an immediate cause. Firefighters could not save Becky Saunders, an elderly widow who lived alone. She died at the scene. Police interviewed Becky Saunders' neighbor. He told investigators she didn't smoke, but she often fell asleep with the TV and lights on. He mentioned a possible electrical problem. The house had been struck by lightning a month or two earlier. Perhaps it had caused some damage that led to the fire. All the neighbors knew Becky and were eager to talk about her. They said she was in good health and quite independent. Fire investigators asked if anyone saw anything unusual. No one did. The Hernando County Sheriff's Arson Unit, led by Detective Mike Owens, searched for answers. When they could not determine the fire's immediate cause, they needed to consider another possibility, arson. Arson investigation is not an exact science. It's a big puzzle. You try to take charred remains and then put them back together. You, we take everything in the room out and try to reproduce the locations of the furniture, uh, everything and anything that was in there, and try and see where you're having low burns, high burns, to see what area the, the fire actually traveled. The debris collected from the house was sent to the lab for analysis. Arson expert Carl Chastain looked for pore patterns or the residue of a flammable chemical, an accelerant, that would indicate arson. What we're trying to determine is, has there been something added to this fire scene that would cause it to burn faster and hotter than it would if it were an accidental fire? That's what we're looking for. We're looking to see if there's been an accelerant added to the fire. The photographs revealed the progression of the fire, which started in the bedroom. Investigators still needed to find out the cause of the fire. But with so much of the evidence destroyed, they knew it would not be easy. In a crime laboratory, we have to be objective. It's not our job to convict somebody or exonerate anyone. It's our job to test the evidence and tell the truth. In this case, we looked at it. We looked at it as closely as we could, and we still could not determine that there was any ignitable liquid in the samples. At the medical examiner's office, the victim's remains were autopsied. Though her blood showed elevated levels of carbon monoxide, indicating that she had inhaled smoke, Dr. Valerie Rao wasn't confident that it was enough to suffocate her. The 
poor condition of her remains made further analysis impossible. Because the investigation um, really did not lead anywhere, um, it was decided by the medical examiner to call it undetermined. Without any evidence to indicate otherwise, Becky Saunders' death remained a mystery. Investigators were left with unanswered questions. The firefighters in Hernando County would soon find themselves battling another blaze. But maybe this could provide some answers. An elderly Spring Hill, Florida resident, Becky Saunders, died trapped inside her burning house. Investigators were unable to determine the actual cause of the fire. Fire rescue, what is your emergency? Ten days later, the Hernando County dispatcher received a call. Another house was on fire, and an elderly couple was trapped inside. Firefighters entered the smoke-filled house and saw a woman collapsed on the floor. They carefully carried her to safety. A man was trapped unconscious in the back of the house. I've got a second victim. The victims, Mr. and Mrs. Ted Burton, were an elderly couple in poor health. They were rushed to the hospital. Forensic supervisor Russ Knodel investigated. Someone had broken into the home, had beaten the elderly lady. Her husband in the bedroom heard the commotion, came out. He was beaten. And then they attempted to set a drape on fire and left. Investigators noticed a bystander engrossed by the rescue. Because entry was forced and the victims were beaten, detectives questioned everyone in the area, including the bystander. His name was Brian Searsley. He said he lived in the neighborhood and that he'd seen nothing suspicious. He agreed to let investigators swab his hands for the telltale signs of an accelerant. He also allowed them to take an article of clothing for further testing. The fire had gone out only moments after it had started. The arson dog was sent in, and investigators collected debris to test for accelerants. If an accelerant was used, detectives believed it might point them in the direction of a suspect. There was some alcohol poured in a dish with a candle the candle was lit and then put underneath the drapes, and the drapes caught on fire. The rest of the house remained undamaged. It was searched thoroughly, looking for anything out of the ordinary. In the bathroom, investigators noticed a cabinet door open. Not sure what it could mean, the cabinet was dusted for prints. At the state arson lab, Brian Searsley's clothes, as well as the swabs and samples from the Burton house, were analyzed. Traces of gasoline were found on his clothes, but there was no evidence of gasoline at the crime scene. He was eliminated as a suspect. Police studied crime scene photographs, hoping to spot something they'd missed. Mrs. Burton suffered from Alzheimer's, okay, and Mr. Burton had lapsed into a coma, so the couple was unable to aid investigators. They found no evidence that the similarities between the Burton fire and the Saunders fire was anything more than coincidence. Now, we know it wasn't a robbery, because as we were going through the home, we opened up the drawer in the bedroom, and that's a picture of the drawer opened up in the bedroom. And if you'll notice, you can start to see a wallet, a man's wallet, when we picked up the wallet and opened it up, it had a lot of cash in it, so we know it wasn't a robber. With no known motive and no possible suspects, the evidence baffled investigators. 
Later that day, another fire was reported in a neighboring town. Single four radio. You have fire on the scene now. We've received a call that there was a fire up in uh, Brookridge. Again, the fire was hot and it had burnt severely to where everything in the bedroom had dropped onto the ground. We processed that scene looking for anything we could find. Like the first victim, 70-year-old Monique Jenkins had been found burned beyond recognition on her bed. And like the last fire, a bathroom cabinet stood open. Once again, most of the evidence was destroyed. But investigators collected what they could from the smoldering debris. The body was burned beyond recognition. At autopsy, the medical examiner was unable to find the cause of death. The examiners did find the victim's hands were bound with duct tape, rendering her helpless. Examiners found no fingerprints on the tape. Again, there was no clear motive for the crime. The detectives approach us and they're looking for anything they can find that will forensically link something or someone to these cases. They're wanting to know if we got fingerprints, they're wanting to know if we got any trace evidence, if we found any accelerants or anything that they can put their hands on to help them in the direction they're going in this case. And at this particular time, we were not able to come up with anything. Very frustrating for the whole team. Okay, folks, we're here today to review the facts that we've come up with thus far. Detectives compared evidence gathered at the three fires, hoping to come up with something that would tie them together. We had a great amount of intense heat inside this uh, master bedroom. It appears to be some type of a home invasion at this point when uh, well, both, both the victims were killed. The intensity of the blaze indicated an accelerant was used to cover up another crime. Once we examined the remains, we clearly showed that uh, she was had been duct taped with her hands clearly duct taped behind her back. So that's really the first indication that uh, we're dealing with something other than accidental fires. This was the crucial piece of evidence that began to link the arsons. Because now we know we had a problem. We felt now we have somebody going around breaking in homes and burning these elderly women up. Police followed through on several leads. None paid off. Worried, a man checked on his neighbor, Rita Talbot, after he hadn't seen her for a few days. Her front porch was littered with unread newspapers. She didn't answer the door. With the key she had given him, the neighbor entered the house. Hello? Hello? He found her in the bedroom, dead. Once again, police were called. They were all too familiar with this neighborhood. In fact, Rita Talbot lived on the same block as Becky Saunders, the first fire victim. Scott? Hey, Russ. What do we got going? Looks like another one. Um, I haven't been in the scene yet, but we have, uh, we're doing some process now on the side of the house. Got an open window, looks like it could be our point of entry. And, uh, but this crime scene was different. The house did not catch fire. Detective Mike Owens noticed the stains around the bed. What we've got is, looks like a pour pattern, Scott. Looks like uh, we've got some alcohol bottles up there on the bed. And what they may have done, or might have been done here, is alcohol poured in the carpet. And not enough with this carpet to substantiate a burn, but it melted all the carpet down. Look at this pattern. Look at the bed. How about the bed? Did the bed get anything? Looking at the bed. So if you look over here, we don't have The crime scene technicians dusted for fingerprints. This time, they found one. The print was lifted and sent to the lab for analysis. 
They collected samples of the carpet, hoping the fibers would yield clues. Cigarette butts and some empty alcohol bottles were recovered. After weeks of frustration, this tragic crime scene produced several key clues. Now, detectives hoped the forensic evidence would bring them closer to capturing the killer. For almost two months, detectives had been tracking a killer who was wreaking havoc on a peaceful Florida neighborhood. At the most recent crime scene, police found several clues, including a fingerprint they hoped would lead them to a suspect. Detective Scott Beerweiler believed the recovery of this evidence was crucial. The past houses of the victims, of the deceased, um, had been burned. A lot of the evidence had been destroyed. We were not real successful in obtaining evidence. So we were all encouraged going into this house, knowing that it was most likely going to be tied with the other victims, same suspect in this. And if we were going to obtain any type of evidence, our best shot was to get it out of this particular house. Fingerprints were also lifted from a vehicle parked in the latest victim's garage. At autopsy, it was revealed there were marks left by the duct tape used to tie her hands behind her back. She had been strangled. All but two of her ribs were broken and her neck was snapped. They also determined she was sexually assaulted. Inside her throat, the medical examiner found a single hair. As detectives gathered their evidence, news of the murder spread. Detective Tom Holly received an anonymous tip. I was finishing up my paperwork. I was working late last night, and I got this anonymous phone call from a female who tried to disguise her voice and kind of only whispered. But she, she said she knew who the, the killer was from Spring Hill, and she gave me the name of Edwin Caprat. So we should have some good quality prints to compare with those of that. What was his name, Caprat, you said? Caprat. It's going to hinge on forensics at this point. Forensic specialist Gary Kimball compared the prints recovered at the crime scene with those on file. Detectives learned Caprat had a long history of arrests. Well, um, he does have a criminal history. He's a convicted felon out of Hillsborough County. And 91, we have a homicide, willful kill, first degree, robbery, and forgery from Tampa PD. They also learned Caprat performed odd jobs for several of the victims. One detective remembered interviewing him at the first crime scene. Kimball believed he was onto something. Forensic supervisor Russ Canodal examined the findings, looking for certain characteristics, such as identical loops and patterns. They were eager to share the news. But since Caprat was a local handyman and worked for several of the victims, his prints could be easily explained. They needed more. That's great. Scratch too. For two weeks, the Pratt was placed under 24-hour surveillance. Their goal was to collect more physical evidence. After he left a local bar, detectives took one of Caprat's cigarette butts, hoping to match his DNA to the saliva on the cigarettes recovered at the crime scene and to the hair found lodged in the victim's throat. The DNA matched. It was the connection they needed. Detectives obtained an arrest warrant and went to the suspect's most recent residence. Michael Caprat was placed under arrest for the most recent arson murder of Rita Talbot.
In a room lined with photos of the crime scenes and the many files police had collected, detectives questioned Caprat. Prior to even interviewing him, we knew that he was our guy, so we, we pushed forward with it. And Detective Douglas and myself kind of took on the, the good guy, bad guy detective. At first, he denied everything. But when confronted with the evidence, he confessed. Once we started our interview, he basically, we couldn't shut him up, basically. He just talked on and on and on and on. During the three-hour interview, he confessed to murders of three women as well as the four arsons. Caprat was charged with three counts of murder, two counts of attempted murder, and three counts of rape. The forensics evidence clinches the case for us, but there's nothing like a confession. According to his confession, Michael Caprat chose elderly victims because he believed they were vulnerable. He broke into their homes and crept into their rooms. He would restrain his victims with duct tape, then proceed to rape and beat them. He poured rubbing alcohol that he took from their own bathrooms, spilling it on and around their beds. He then lit a match. For his crimes, Michael Caprat was sentenced to death. On April 19, 1995, he was killed by another death row inmate. Fire can be used as a powerful weapon. Killers who choose it know little is left in its wake. Hey guys, how we doing? Though some hope it will successfully hide their crimes, many perpetrators discover forensic evidence can survive long after the fire is out. And their trial by fire leads directly to justice. charred body is discovered in the smoldering aftermath. But how she turned up dead remains a mystery. Detectives turn to forensic science in the hopes of uncovering the answers to their many questions. When investigators start sifting through the ashes, they have no idea it will lead to a trail of deception. This is a case of out-and-out -out lies, and not one, but two cold-blooded murders. When people trust their killer with their secrets, their money, and their lives, it can very well turn out to be a tragic case of misplaced loyalty. this episode, some of the names have been changed. The city of Berkeley, California, is well known for its hippie counterculture and bohemian lifestyle. Nestled in the rolling hills just across the bridge from San Francisco, it's a magnet for people of all walks of life. Criminals can hide in plain sight making it a perfect place to cover up an insidious crime. In the early morning hours of June 25, 1994, a loud explosion rocked the home of James Hutchings. It was four in the morning, and his next door neighbor, Virginia Bailey's house was on fire. He rushed to call the fire department but took consolation in the knowledge that Bailey was out of town. Yeah, there, there's a fire. My neighbor's house is on fire. Yes. 29 long you know who lives here? Virginia Bailey? Is she at home right now? She's out of town. OK, we're sending the fire department. We're on the way. Thank you. Dispatchers immediately dispatched the Berkeley Fire Department to the scene.
firefighters rushed to what they thought was an unoccupied home. When they arrived, shooting flames were visible through the window. Working deliberately for several hours, the firemen extinguished the fire. Firefighters entered the house to make sure the fire was out. They noticed the majority of the damage from the blaze was in the dining room. Deputy Fire Marshal Wayne Inouye was on the scene. When I got on the scene, I found a two-story residential uh, dwelling. I went into the first floor, and the first floor wasn't that badly damaged. I proceeded up to the second floor, and that's where the majority of the fire damage was. There was a lot of smoke damage uh, on the second floor, and in the dining room, it was, there was heavy fire damage. Hey Chuck, shine your light in here, over to the right. What is that? Body. Is it body? It was there they made a shocking discovery. A body lying face down in the smoldering debris, clearly dead. We got a confirmed 8900 in this location. Notify the fire marshals. Better get the coroner started up this way. They also noticed something odd about the scene. The room was virtually without furniture, and the body was found six feet from the fireplace. When firefighters discover a body, they are required to notify the coroner's office. Coroner technicians arrived on the scene. They noticed the victim had severe burns on both her head and her hands. James Hutchings was shocked to learn that his neighbor might have perished in the fire. He knew Virginia was supposed to be in Salt Lake City for a wedding. And if she were home, he wondered why her car was not in the driveway. You looked out the window, did you see anybody out there? No. Anybody running from the house? Nope, just flames. How about flames? With what they learned from the neighbor, investigators now turned to science to piece together the events that led to a tragic outcome. An autopsy was performed at the state crime lab in Berkeley, California. Even though Virginia Bailey was reportedly out of town, forensic experts identified the body using x-rays. The victim was Virginia Bailey. She was home at the time of the fire. But other evidence quickly deemed the exam anything but routine. Upon looking at the body, the first thing the ME noticed was severe decomposition a finding inconsistent with the person who supposedly just died. I think I'd like to look at the x-rays. We're going to do, we're going to, we're going to suffer here. Even more telling were maggots found in the chest cavity and on the clothing of the corpse. Maggots usually take somewhere between 24 to 48 hours to appear and do so only on dead bodies but there could be no logical reason they would appear on the charred body of a fire victim so soon after her death. Dr. Paul Herman of the coroner's office reviewed the autopsy results and examined the photographs. There was something peculiar about this case because there was evidence of decomposition of the body, uh, even to the point uh, that there were some maggots present on the body and in the clothing. Uh, indicating that this person had died long before this fire had occurred. Since the autopsy revealed the presence of maggots, entomologist Jeffrey Wells was brought in to help establish time of death. Due to their size, he was able to determine that Bailey died at least three days before she appeared to be killed in the fire. If you estimate the age of a maggot found on a body, 
this gives you a pretty good minimum time since death. Uh, the reason for this is flies almost never deposit their eggs or larvae on a live person. Almost always the person must be dead when that happens. If I can estimate the age of a maggot, that gives me a minimum time since death. For example, if I pluck a maggot off of a corpse, and I am pretty sure that it is three days old, almost certainly that person has been dead for at least three days. Dr. Wells definitively concluded that Virginia Bailey didn't die in the fire. Investigators' worst fears were coming to light. The case was now a criminal matter, and at the Berkeley Police Department, Inspector Al Bierce was assigned the file. Things clearly didn't add up, and Bierce needed to find out what or who had killed Virginia Bailey. If she had died naturally, it would have been impossible for this fire to have occurred as a natural outgrowth of her death. For example, if she was walking across the room with some kind of a material and then suffered a heart attack, fell, started the fire, there wasn't going to be any de decomposition there. Bierce's first move was to meet with the victim's brother, who had some questions of his own. They began to create a timeline leading up to Virginia's death. When was the last time that you talked to her by phone? He hadn't heard from his sister for weeks before the fire. He always got a call from his sister on his birthday. He didn't get a call. That was totally out of character for her. Virginia and her brother were extremely close and had recently attended Hi. a friend's wedding. Hello there. I just want both of you to know that I love her brother believed so that something didn't so sit right about his sister's disappearance. Both of you are just made for each other. He said the and two usually clean, spoke all the time. Yet he had left messages on her answering machine and heard nothing back, back from her. Virginia's brother told Inspector Bierce that Christine Lloyd, Virginia's financial advisor, had been house-sitting for his sister. He also told him that some of Virginia's furniture was missing from her house. That's all I've got for now. I know where you are down at the motel. Inspector Bierce was faced with many questions. He was at the beginning of a complicated investigation. Bierce needed to uncover evidence to find out if someone had killed Virginia Bailey and tried to make it look like an accidental fire death. And perhaps what he was looking for was buried in the ashes of the fire. A deadly fire ravaged the home of Virginia Bailey, and investigators grew suspicious. After only a preliminary investigation, Berkeley Police Inspector Al Bierce thought he had a murder on his hands. Autopsy reports revealed the presence of maggots on a body found at the scene of the fire. Scientists conclusively proved that Virginia Bailey had already been dead for at least three days before the fire started. Inspector Bierce decided to visit the scene of the crime firsthand. When he arrived, the fire investigator pointed out burn patterns. There's no charring on the wood or anything, so the leads believe that this it didn't start here at the fireplace. Things did not did. add up. So this will be real important that we get this done they now. noticed evidence of poor patterns near the body. Did we come in with a uh, snipper that night? This would indicate the presence of an accelerant. It was poured over the body. And perhaps the most telling sign, the body was discovered over six feet from the fireplace. I'm seeing it right here. Right, right if the fire began in the fireplace, there should be burn marks that led to the body. There were none. The area directly surrounding the body was suspiciously intact. The investigator believed this was arson. He hoped those closest to Virginia could provide him with information as to how and why she died in the fire. Uh, I had something I wanted to, to show 
He asked Christine Lloyd, the victim's financial advisor and best friend, to meet him there. She was house sitting for Virginia. When Christine Lloyd arrived, she told Inspector Bierce she and Virginia were close friends, and she had been her financial advisor for about 10 years. But there was something else that I needed to Christine was watching the house while Virginia was in San Francisco the week before the fire. But she said she never saw Virginia's body in the dining room. Christine said she went back to the house right after the fire. She and a friend were there trying to rescue Virginia's items from the burned house. It was then they saw something in the downstairs apartment that Virginia usually rented. Christine said this was unusual because the apartment was vacant. She showed Bierce what she had found in the downstairs rental unit. Christine said she was worried that someone had been staying downstairs. She told the detective she noticed something disturbing about the condition of the rental apartment's refrigerator. Oh, my God. Whoa. How did this happen? Christine Lloyd pointed out the refrigerator, and she said that just a week before, it had been totally clean, and the shelves had been inside. When she showed it to me, the shelves were out of it, and there was a residue on the bottom of the refrigerator, suggestive of the fact that something had been stored there. And she was telling me that nothing had been stored there the last time she had seen it. How many days before the fire were you here? I was here a couple of days ago. In the bedroom, Bierce found a terrible mess. Right. Looks like somebody's been living in here. There was a mattress on the floor and bottles strewn everywhere. Okay. Look in here. Look at this. The uninvited resident had left the apartment in disarray. The refrigerator contained what appeared to be a dark liquid residue that looked like blood. To determine what it was, crime technicians performed a luminol test. Also in the refrigerator, what appeared to be a small clump of hair riddled with maggots. Inspector Bierce had the technician remove the hair clump and take a swabbing of the red liquid. Swab that liquid. The samples were sent to the lab for further examination. But it was quickly determined that the substance wasn't blood and the hair did not belong to Virginia. And Bierce made another unusual discovery. The smoke detector for the downstairs unit had been unplugged. Oh, yeah. That's I went into that room with a very skeptical eye, and it looked staged. That was put there so that somebody would think that somebody had been crashing there, and potentially the person who was crashing there was the person who'd gone upstairs and killed the victim. Bierce's suspicions continued to grow. Little things about the scene troubled him like how unusually neat, strategic, and organized the squatter's mess seemed. That despite all the bottles strewn about, there were no bottle caps. There were also no fingerprints on the bottles. To him, the whole scene felt manufactured. Jeffrey Wells examined the hair found in the refrigerator for the presence of maggots. The maggots he found were alive. Types of maggots vary. Those found in the downstairs refrigerator were scuttlefly maggots, different from the fleshfly maggots found on Virginia Bailey's body. The ones in the apartment were insects attracted to rotting food, as well as human remains. All this information troubled Inspector Bierce. 
But perhaps the most puzzling was the fact that Christine Lloyd said she hadn't seen Virginia's body. After all, she had been dead for at least three days. If the body was in the refrigerator, that would support Christine's story. But the science wasn't adding up. If the body was not hidden in the refrigerator, where had it been? I'm saying, okay, some part of this doesn't make any sense. Either she's aware that the body is there and has some, played some role in, in the body being there, or somebody is coming in after the fact and planted the body there. It's not going to make a, a great deal of sense to me. Inspector Bierce was beginning to think Christine Lloyd knew more. Perhaps she could shed more light on Virginia's whereabouts before the fire started. He decided to look a little harder at Christine's story. Virginia Bailey was found dead in her Berkeley, California home, and the circumstances surrounding her death were suspicious. The presence of maggots on the body proved she had been dead for some time before the fire. And the story told by the victim's friend, Christine Lloyd, was not adding up. It looked as if Inspector Al Bierce was piecing together a murder. So how can I help you? Well, as we talked about the detective the phone, met with her I'm to ask her some follow-up questions. To find out what I can about her, her habits. She put herself in the house every single day. She put herself into the house as late as 14 hours before the fire. I've got a coroner who's telling me, or who has told me, that the victim's dead for at least two days. She's found in an area where Christine Lloyd would have had to have passed through the room within feet of the body to feed the cats and to get the mail. I'm going to leave my card. It seemed unlikely to Bierce that Virginia could have died of natural causes and lay there for days before the fire ignited. You can call me or have them call me. It was time to do some legwork to learn more about the victim. Bierce began questioning friends and business associates of Virginia's. He started with her co-worker, Mary Cates, who said Virginia wasn't scheduled to go to San Francisco, as Christine had said. Mary also told Inspector Bierce that Virginia had been missing work lately. Since this was completely out of character, she said she called Virginia to make sure she was okay. She left a message on her answering machine, but never received a call back from Virginia. But said Christine Lloyd called her to tell her Virginia was out of town. Bierce spoke to several of Virginia's friends, and they all had the same story. When they would call Virginia, they'd get a call back from Christine Lloyd. Good. I, uh... Since Bierce determined Virginia had many friends who were concerned about her whereabouts, mm -hmm. he found it odd that no one had actually been able to reach her in the days prior to the fire. She had missed appointments on the 17th, 18th, and 19th? Yes, correct. One friend, Alicia Jackson, was so concerned, she headed over to her house to make sure she was okay. but there was no answer. Only a note on the door saying she was in San Francisco. She thought this was odd, but left her own note, hoping to hear back from her missing friend. We're obviously Bierce was puzzled. Hearing from anybody we can. Although all her friends were being helpful, no one offered anything that gave the investigation focus. Okay. Okay, thank you. Virginia's brother came back to the police station and offered up a charred piece of evidence. It was Virginia's answering machine, presumably full of messages from concerned friends. Inspector Bierce sent the tape to the DOJ crime lab in the hopes of salvaging the burned cassette. Perhaps the messages on the machine would lead to answers as to why every time someone tried to make contact with Virginia, 
they made contact with Christine Lloyd instead. Be in touch with what we Bierce ran a background check on Christine Lloyd. She came up clean, except for a minor traffic violation. Since Christine was Virginia's financial advisor, Inspector Bierce decided to get a warrant to examine the victim's financial records. Bierce, come on in. Okay. Have a seat. Um, Bierce went to Virginia's bank for answers. Years of experience taught Bierce Study a victim's finances, and you'll likely uncover a motive. Virginia's bank activity had reached a fever pitch in the weeks before her death. Large checks were written against Virginia's account, not only to Christine, but also to a woman named Myrtle Lloyd. About 50% of the proceeds of that account went to Christine Lloyd. One peculiar thing Bierce noted was a certified foreclosure letter dated the 13th of June. Christine was responsible for making sure all of the bills were paid on time. Certified mail. And she had given him no indication that Virginia was in such severe financial trouble. And another red flag something that made no sense for a woman who was in dire financial straits and about to lose her home. A flurry of checks written in June, the end of a six-month spending spree totaling thousands of dollars. In total, four checks were made out to Christine and Myrtle Lloyd, some dated after Virginia's death. Bierce believed he found a motive, embezzlement. Now he needed some kind of smoking gun. Bierce asked Virginia's manager for ATM surveillance tapes at Virginia's bank. He also poured over every financial document he could find. Do we have one for And there, among the detailed receipts from Virginia's account, came a startling discovery. Inspector Bierce found receipts for both an accelerant and a garden hose. Given the date of that purchase and the fact that an accelerant was very possibly used in the ignition of the fire, it provided a nexus between that purchase and the fact that the fire had occurred. It looked as if Christine had been using Virginia's account and the purchase of two 40-ounce cans of lighter fluid and a hose on her account just days before the fire was quickly turning friend into suspect. Oh, we can put it in your Pierce's next step was to watch the surveillance video provided by Virginia's bank. Now you had queued this up already? Yeah, this is already queued up. It contained no surprise. Clear as day, there was Christine Lloyd signing Virginia's checks and deposit slips on checks made out to herself. The checks were in the exact amount of Virginia's missing mortgage payments. One of the checks was dated three days before Virginia's death. Yet it was cashed three days after her death. It was made out to Myrtle Lloyd. Bierce needed to know who this woman was and if she and Christine were working together to steal Virginia's money. Since their last names were the same, he presumed the two were related. Bierce did a records check on Myrtle Lloyd. What he found out was perhaps the most disturbing thing yet in this perplexing case. Myrtle Lloyd was Christine's mother, and Myrtle Lloyd was dead. It appeared that Christine was not only signing checks on Virginia's account for herself, she was also signing checks made out to a dead woman, her own mother. Bierce visited with the Oakland police, who looked into Myrtle Lloyd's death. He wanted details. Captain Ralph Lacer of the Oakland Police Department remembered her story. 
He told Beers that Myrtle had been found dead in her bathtub with severe bruises to her face and lacerations to her head. And she was doing some financial things for her, and it's looking right now like she was taking... Because there were no obvious signs of foul play, and police believed Christine's story, the coroner ruled Myrtle's death an accident. After finding no um, sign of forced entry in the residence, there was no loss in the residence, or no one appeared to have kind of rummaged through the residence, uh, it came out that we didn't see anything that showed it was a hands of another, and at this point they, they ruled that it was an accidental death. It may, maybe would have come across as an accidental death. But knowing what I then, have, Bierce learned that Christine Lloyd had found her mother's body. That she had seen the mother the day before, and that she had uh, left and uh, done some shopping, and then she was bringing some groceries back to the house. According to the July 1991 police reports, Christine Lloyd said she returned home from the grocery store. was surprised when her mom was nowhere to be found. Mom? 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 It was when she entered the bathroom that she made the startling discovery of her mother's body. Mom! 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 Then things just clicked for the detective. He instinctively knew he had a second murder on his hands. And he was determined to get the evidence necessary to prove it. While investigating the death of Virginia Bailey, Inspector Al Bierce believed he had uncovered another murder. And he was convinced the same killer committed both crimes. The woman who had been so helpful from the beginning was now a suspect. At that point in the investigation, I knew that she'd killed my victim in Berkeley, and I knew that she had killed her mother three years before. Uh, and I knew that she had done a very good job of concealing that death three years, to, years ago to make it look like an accidental death, not murder. He was beginning to put it all together, but there were still some unanswered questions. Bierce went to the Oakland coroner's office to find out more. Dr. Paul Herman performed the autopsy on Myrtle Lloyd. When I walked in the bathroom, uh, I would have expected to find a great deal of blood uh, spattered about in the, bath in the bathroom because of these injuries to the head. This was not what he thought he'd find. After all, the victim had severe head wounds. There should have been blood everywhere. But then Dr. Herman saw the smallest of clues. He also noticed more signs that the scene had been meticulously clean. Uh, this bathroom was clean. The water had been drained from the tub, and there was some debris from decomposition uh, and probably blood at the bottom of the tub, but no spattering of blood around there at all. And, and that's what I would have expected to see. The bone. But there are Myrtle that Lloyd are was killed so by seven separate lacerations to the back of her head. Christine explained that her mother was prone to seizures and said that she had fallen in the bathtub. And in addition, she had a laceration of her forehead. Bierce knew things were not adding up. And after visiting Oakland, his suspicions about Christine escalated. He believed the crime scene was too neat almost in direct contrast to the scene in Berkeley. Yeah, they're on both sides, and some but both are appeared on staged the nonetheless. To test their suspicions, investigators spoke with Myrtle Lloyd's doctors to determine if she had been ill or had any known conditions that would make her unsteady on her feet. What they found out would break the cold case wide open. Myrtle was in excellent health and had no history of seizures. By now, Detective Bierce was convinced of Christine Lloyd's guilt. He was ready to make an arrest. What he needed was a charge. At this point, there was not enough direct evidence to make a murder arrest. 
since Christine had signed Virginia Bailey's name on checks. His best bet was forgery. He turned to handwriting expert Verl Truman, a forensic document examiner with the U.S. Postal Inspection Service, and asked him to look at the checks for fraud. Handwriting examination is basically a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, the basis for the identification of handwriting is the fact that no two persons share the same combination of individual uh, identifying handwriting characteristics. We look for various features and habits of the writer. We look for the way the person makes beginning strokes, ending strokes, or connecting strokes between letters and letter combinations. We look at things such as the relative height ratio and proportion of letters and in relation to other letters. He found subtle differences between their handwriting styles, which Truman said were patterns and traits that every individual develops over the years. Now these characteristics, uh, it's, it's very difficult to cast off your habits when you're either imitating the handwriting of another person or if you're trying to disguise your own writing. Usually some of your habits will still show through. And Christine was unable to completely disguise hers. But perhaps the most telling sign was not an actual letter or a word. But a unique and personal signature symbol. Virginia Bailey used a uh, star as a dollar sign in her writing, and she constructed that character uh, beginning and ending at the lower left corner or seven o'clock position. Uh, Christine Lloyd, on the other hand, did it completely uh, opposite. She began it and started it at the lower right. Uh, that was a feature that she just happened to, to miss. Inspector Bierce now had proof of forgery. But what he needed was proof of murder. Bierce decided to take another look at the days prior to the fire. Christine was the only one with Virginia's house key and the only one who seemed to know anything about Virginia's whereabouts. She'd even been returning Virginia's phone messages. At the state crime lab, technicians worked to restore the message tape from Virginia Bailey's answering machine. Uh, stick around. I'll, uh, play this. Investigators were now able to retrieve the messages, although they had no idea what they'd find. By comparing the phone records to the voice messages, Inspector Bierce was able to piece together the chain of events leading up to and following Virginia's murder. The calls reflected a growing concern about Virginia's disappearance on June 13th, 12 days before the fire. And oddly, many of the outgoing calls Bierce found on Virginia's phone records began on that very day. There was information that came to me during the course of the investigation that suggested that the victim had died on June 13th. That was the last time anybody ever talked to her. And it was the time through phone records that I showed that she had made a call to Christine. The pieces were falling into place. Bierce felt he was close to being able to make an arrest. He paid a visit to another one of Virginia's neighbors, Sam Watson. Watson told of helping Christine carry a large dining room table, as well as other items, from Virginia's house before the fire. She then sold them at a yard sale. Christine had denied having any idea what had happened to that table. Every part of Christine Lloyd's story seemed suspect.
Investigators believe she was in a frenzy of greed, intent on fully taking over her friend's assets through any means possible. Step towards me, ma'am. Step towards me. Keep walking. You stop. Turn around with your back towards me. Face the house. Face the house. In early December of 1994, Inspector Al Bierce arrested Christine Lloyd for murder and took her into custody. Bierce was convinced that Christine Lloyd had masterminded two murders. That Christine? But he only had enough evidence to bring her in for the murder of Virginia Bailey. He believed she was motivated by money and greed. You have the right to remain silent. Anything and he wanted to see Christine Lloyd behind bars. You have the right to an attorney. To have that Christine attorney Lloyd refused to speak to police. She refused to take a polygraph test. You understand those rights as, as I... Instead, she asked for her attorney. She was processed into the system. Although Christine Lloyd was sticking to her guns regarding Virginia Bailey, when asked about her mother, she shook her head and told Bierce he was wrong. She said she was a loving daughter who doted on her mother and would never do anything to harm her. Apparently, Christine Lloyd was convincing. At the time of the arrest, the district attorney's office didn't feel comfortable going ahead and prosecuting the case. What's your name? Christine. They didn't feel the evidence was strong enough to get a conviction. Her immediate release was ordered. Please check and make sure everything is there. As she walked out of the jail, Inspector Al Bierce despaired. I knew that she had embezzled from her mother leading up to the murder of her mother. I knew that she had embezzled from my victim leading to her mur murder. And from a personal standpoint, that wasn't something I could let go of. Convinced he was dealing with a murderer who had already killed twice, Inspector Bierce wasn't about to let it rest. He needed more evidence. He turned to forensic scientists to help him bring this killer to justice. Berkeley County investigator Al Bierce pieced together a story of greed, lies, and murder. He was convinced Christine Lloyd killed both her best friend and her own mother. Now, despite nearly a year on the case, hundreds of hours of legwork and compelling evidence, he was watching her go free. She was guilty, and I couldn't let go. Al Bierce was now working all hours, trying to plug any holes in what he thought was an airtight case against Christine Lloyd. The district attorney's office refused to prosecute the case, stating the evidence was circumstantial and it would not hold up in court. But Al Bierce had worked too hard to let this one slip through his fingers. By the time I got through, when I was that, at that point in the investigation, I knew that she'd killed my victim in Berkeley, and I knew that she had killed her mother three years before. Uh, and I knew that she had done a very good job of concealing that death three years, to, years ago to make it look like an accidental death, not murder. Bierce approached Thomas Rogers, the head of the trial staff at the DA's office in Alameda County. After hearing the details of Bierce's investigation, he too became determined to bring the case to justice. I made a commitment that I was going to try the case. In our business, uh, many of the cases are much more interesting than what we see on television. There's a tremendous human drama involved. For anybody who is curious, uh, you have a woman who's 55 years old with no record. Why did she kill uh, her best friend?
This was the question puzzling investigators for over a year. LOL, Tom Rogers. But as Bierce and Rogers discovered, it all came down to money. Christine Lloyd had been cashing her mother's civil service pension checks. And the men believed that once Virginia Bailey confronted Christine about the house foreclosure, it was only a matter of time before authorities began looking into Christine's finances and found out about Myrtle Lloyd. But despite all the circumstantial evidence, the clear motive of embezzlement, and the testimony of the handwriting analyst, it would be a tough case to try. There was no cause of death, no eyewitnesses, no smoking gun. D.A. Rogers decided to take one last look at the pile of evidence Inspector Bierce had uncovered. After weeks of combing through the findings, he was convinced. The final link to justice and punishment would come down to a tiny piece of living evidence. The most compelling evidence was the entomology evidence. If we did not have the entomology evidence, we never would have been able to prove the case. The fact that maggots will only feed on a dead body was the only piece of conclusive proof that Virginia was dead long before the fire. But it was the proof that made Rogers feel comfortable enough to try the case. And it was the one hole in Christine Lloyd's story which all the other lies would come rushing through. She placed herself in the house during the time of Virginia's death and the time of the fire. This would be the crux of the prosecutor's case. That Christine Lloyd had committed Virginia Bailey's murder and spent two weeks manufacturing an elaborate crime scene to cover her tracks. In July of 1995, one year after the fire that killed her best friend, Virginia Bailey, Christine Lloyd was once again arrested. But this time, she was headed to trial. Once again, Lloyd refused to speak to the man who had made it his mission to put her behind bars. But by now, Bierce and D.A. Rogers had fully patched together what had happened to Virginia Bailey and the events leading up to her murder. Near trial, we reinvestigated and were able to prove through uh, statements and, and circumstantial evidence that clearly Christine Lloyd had killed her mother. And that the motive then for killing Virginia Bailey was to avoid a re-examination of the mother's death. Virginia Bailey had no idea her dear friend Christine Lloyd had been embezzling from her. So when she came home on the afternoon of June 13, 1994, to find a registered foreclosure note from her bank, Virginia was undoubtedly surprised and angry. She panicked. She found Christine, and she said, you know, you're my financial advisor. What is the deal here? There was a three-and-a-half-minute call to Christine's house in Martinez. At that point, Christine knew she was caught, and it wouldn't be long before everyone knew the deadly secrets she had been hiding for three years. She showed up at the house intent on murder. Using a blunt object, she brutally struck Virginia until she was dead. It would now be up to a jury to determine if Christine Lloyd was the murderous woman Al Bierce was convinced she was. 
But Al Bierce also wanted justice for Myrtle Lloyd and uncovered that Christine was the sole beneficiary of a $100,000 life insurance policy. So as Christine sat in jail awaiting trial for one murder, the investigation continued on the second. This was enough to indict once again for murder. Driven by the same greed, Christine had inflicted a beating on her elderly mother. Christine Lloyd was convicted of two counts of first degree murder and one count of arson. She received two consecutive life sentences. Planning, executing, and covering up their crimes, sometimes murderers think too much. Sometimes it is this over-planning that leads investigators to their front doors. And as long as those investigators are listening for clues, they'll have the forensic resources to back up their hunches. And clever killers will continue to be brought to justice.